All right. Uh, welcome, welcome to, to the, the April, April 3rd, 3rd meeting of the Transportation, Transportation Environment, Environment Committee. Committee. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind committee members and members of the public to follow our code of conduct at meetings, including commenting on the public agenda item only, on the specific agenda items only, and addressing the full body. Public speakers will not engage in conversation with the chair, council members, board members, et cetera. All members of the committee uh, are staff and public are expected to refrain from abusive language and failure to comply uh, could result in removal from the meeting. So we will call the meeting to order and take roll. Gondelas? Present. Ortiz? Present. Foley? Here. Davis? Here. And Cohen? Here. Thank you. Great, thank you. So we, our first item on the agenda today is an update on bike plan 2025. So Jessica, take it away. Great, thank you, uh, Chair Cohen and members of the committee. Uh, today is one of our favorite days of the year when we give the annual update on both our bike plan and trail network. This is a joint effort by parks and recreation staff, as well as the Department of Transportation. As we know that from the user perspective, these are all one system, one network. So with me today, I have Liz Sewell from the Department of Parks, Recs, and Neighborhood Services, and Ryan Smith, our Manager of Active Transportation, as well as Division Manager Ramses Madhu. And with no further ado, I will turn it over to Liz. Thank you, Jess. As Jess mentioned, my name is Liz Sewell. I am the trail manager for the city of San Jose, and I'm here with Ryan Smith. And today we're gonna give an update of the city's bike and trail networks. Um, and we're also gonna talk about the funding for these trail networks. Um, next slide. So during this presentation, um, Ryan and I will discuss the trails program and the better bike um, plan of 20 for 2025. Um, and we'll also cover project updates and recent accomplishments, and then we'll go over funding needs. Next slide. So this map is of the San Jose Trail Network. It's our public facing map. Um, in green, you can see the open trails and in orange are the trails that have been planned and are at some, some stage of development. Um, in 2001, we only had 20 miles of urban trails, um, but in 2023, this year, we have over 63 miles of urban trail. Um, so that is quite an accomplishment, and we are really trying to move forward very aggressively on the remaining 40 trails. Um, in the future, we would like to see 100 miles of urban and 30 miles of rural and trails such as um, those at Alum Rock. Um, next slide. So um, here you can see all the stages of trail development from identify to open, complete, constructed. Um, we currently have trails in each of these stages, including administrative stages and right-of-way stages. Um, there's over 30 trail, active trail projects and over 40 trail funding streams, including local funding and grant funding. Um, the cost to complete the net the network is going to be about 4 million, um, I'm sorry, about 400 million. That actually has probably gone up about um, one and a half to two X over the past couple of years with inflation. Um, right now we have a couple of staff uh, devoted to trail development, but we are in the process of hiring a couple more. Next slide. All right, thanks, Liz. So shifting over to the on-street network, uh, in October 2020, Council adopted a new bike plan, Better Bike Plan 2025. Uh, the vision of that plan is basically anybody who lives or works in San Jose, regardless of age, ability, or background, can feel comfortable biking on our streets. Uh, the plan set out three primary goals for development and implementation of the plan, safety, uh, equity, and mode shift, getting more people to ride bikes. And the plan sets out for a 550 mile bikeways network, uh, mostly of bike boulevards and protected bikeways, which I'll uh, define in a slide coming up. This slide shows the existing network in San Jose, along with some of the 2022 accomplishments for our on-street network. And so just to go over a couple of those, we currently have 16 miles of protected bikeways and 16 miles of bike boulevards. And that's for a total of 460 
uh, combines with uh, other bike type bikeway types for 460 miles of bikeways on street. Our planned network is 350 miles of protected bikeways, with 100 miles of bike boulevards. So we have a lot of work to do um, in upgrading our existing network and adding new miles to achieve this goal. 2022 accomplishments include 33 new miles of new bikeways, which you can see in purple on the map and how they're spread out geographically across the city, uh, along with 18 miles of enhancements to existing bikeways. This slide uh, shows some examples of protected bikeways and bike boulevards, the primary focus of what we're trying to provide the community on our streets. Um, and just a couple of, couple of details here in the upper left, you can see a protected bikeway that uses quick build separation. Um, so plastic posts allow us to really quickly implement these types of bikeways on our streets. As funding becomes available, as you see in the bottom left, um, our goal is to upgrade as many of these as possible with something more, more uh, substantial, such as concrete, landscaping, and where feasible, green stormwater infrastructure. On the right are a couple of examples of bike boulevards. Bike boulevards are typically on calmer neighborhood streets, um, and they use different elements like traffic circles or other traffic diversion to make it more comfortable for bikes and prioritize bikes um, over motorized vehicles. Two words. Thank you, Ryan. So this slide shows um, all of the trails that we have completed over the past couple of years, plus the trails that are slated for completion over the next couple of years. So it's a really exciting slide to see um, because it really shows the continuity of trails that we're establishing in the city of San Jose. Um, you can see, so light green trails have been completed since um, 2021 and the blue have are slated to be constructed by 2025. So you can see that we're moving forward pretty aggressively on the Coyote Creek Trail, um, as well as the Three Creeks Trail has a couple of projects, one that was just completed and one that is slated to be complete over the next couple of years. We are currently in construction um, along the Thompson Creek Trail between Quimby and Aborn Court. Um, and the Penitentia Creek Trail, we were able to realign over the past couple of years after it uh, suffered some erosion um, and bank failure, basically. And also on here is the Coyote Creek uh, Singleton Crossing, which was, uh, which was completed in 2021. So I will, we don't like to really um, discuss plans further out than a couple of years, just because there's always, there's, stuff arises with trails like valley water coordination and other rights of way coordination um, and, and trails are put on pause sometimes. But we hope to have exciting news about the Guadalupe River Trail um, in CD9 and 6 and 3, um, as well as the Bay Trail and a couple of other trails. So look forward to that. Next slide. Um, so for the completed projects of note, I, I, we pulled a few. Uh, the first one is the Three Creeks Trail. So this one was completed and constructed last year between Lonis and Co. Um, it's open to the public. It was funded through local dollars. Uh, it, it, um, so previously in 2018, our DOT uh, implemented a street crossing at Co to complement this trail. So it, that's, this is one of the instances where it's really helpful to have coordination between DOT and PRNS. Next slide. Another completed project of note is the Five Wounds Trail feasibility study. So this, this project has not been constructed yet, but it kind of showcases all of the, the, uh, the phases of trail development prior to actual construction. Um, this, this is still just the planning phase. We have another planning phase that we need to conduct and it, that, that phase will begin this summer as soon as uh, the city acquires land from the BTA. Um, this particular project involved a lot of community outreach. We had several community outreach meetings um, and there has been additional community outreach since 2010 and engagement of the public. Um, there's a lot of excitement about this trail. So we're, we're moving it forward as quickly as we can. Um, this particular phase was funded by local dollars and Coastal Conservancy. Um, and as I said, the master plan is going to be 
um, begun this summer. We're also, again, closely coordinating with our DOT because this project will have a lot of intersections, um, trail, trail street intersections. Next slide. And finally, uh, the Coyote Creek Trail between Maybury and Empire Street. So this will connect the, near the, the Berryessa BART station and uh, Watson Park. And there was, um, so we recently completed design that was in May of last year, and we're about to enter construction in July. Um, this was funded by the Active Transportation Program, the ATP, it's a federal funding program. Um, and we're going to begin construction, as I said, in July, and it will hopefully um, be completed by next fall. And that's, that's all. All right, thanks, Liz. Um, in 2022, we completed a number of exciting projects, and we'd like to share a few of those with you for our on-street bikeways network. Um, one of the most visible ones in downtown was the completion of the 10th and 11th Street bikeway. This project added a local access frontage lane to 10th and 11th Street, where bikes and cars can share space, access on-street parking, and access driveways. This was to um, contend with kind of some design challenges for implementing b protected bikeways. And we have lots of driveways and uh, short block segments that need to be accounted for. This allowed us to create a separated space for bikes and cars um, in light of some of these design challenges. And if this is successful, we'd like to implement this elsewhere in similar kind of contexts. Um, this project also added transit boarding islands. Uh, which minimizes or uh, eliminates the need for buses to cross the bike lane in order to access bus stops. And this also allows buses to travel a bit faster down the corridor as they don't need to pull all the way over to the curb. This project also up upgraded the temporary quick build materials that I discussed previously to permanent hardscape. Um, much of our on-street bikeways uh, annual work plan is completed in uh, coordination with our paving program and a couple of exciting projects that came out of coordinating with our paving program for bikeways this year. We completed two lane reductions which is essentially reducing car capacity, removing travel lanes um, where traffic demand isn't necessary um, for the amount of lanes on a street and repurposing those for other modes, in this case bikes. So you can see on the left, we completed a uh, lane reduction on Quimby Road in Council District 8 and added some plastic posts. Um, and then on the right, we completed a similar project on Pearl Avenue in Council District 9. Plastic posts for this are on their way. Both of these projects were coordinated very uh, closely with the community, including schools along the route. And uh, on Quimby Road, we also coordinated carefully with the Parks Department as a new trail, the Thompson Creek Trail, interfaces with this project. Another really exciting project happened in South San Jose. Um, this is a multi-year project. It was coordination between City, Caltrans, and BTA to redesign the 101 Blossom Hill Freeway Interchange. This gave us a great opportunity to make improvements for people walking and biking by adding a fully separated bicycle and pedestrian bridge um, to give people really safe and kind of seamless access. This link really creates uh, a way for people to connect from residences west of the freeway to a lot of businesses and employment centers to the east. It's a very exciting project. Um, some projects that are under development. So we have a lot of grant funding right now to um, upgrade a lot of the plastic posts we have around downtown. Um, and out to the BART station in Council District 4 to permanent concrete separation. So on the right, you can see examples um, heading out to the BART station and, heading, uh, and along San Fernando. Um, these will be upgraded to concrete in the coming year or so. Um, we also have similar projects on the Key Road in Council District 5, Bascom Avenue in Council District 6, and several um, streets in the East San Jose and Movimiento plan, which Council adopted in Districts 3 and 5. Additionally, we will be continuing to implement our bike plan along with the city's paving program. We're aiming for about 19 new miles of bikeways this year and around 15 miles of existing bikeways that will enhance. 
I'll talk a little bit about bike plan funding and strategies and our funding needs. So as I mentioned, we use quick build materials to quickly, rapidly get a network on the ground that people can start to use. As um, funding becomes available, we plan to upgrade as much as we can to permanent kind of hardscape, uh, landscaping, and when feasible, green stormwater infrastructure. Um, it's a large plan, so we're focusing on the right in some areas where we think our goals will be achieved first, based on safety, based on demand for bicycling and other factors. We've also carved out of our 550 mile um, network a five year plan that we're calling the priority network, which you can see on the right. Um, bike plan has cost estimates. You can see what full build out would cost versus the various focus areas. So um, on the left of this table at the bottom, you can see that using quick build materials just in the focus area would be about 120 million. The full network with concrete materials would be about $370 million. The next slide, if I can just uh, keep your attention to the left for a moment. Um, so we consider the bike plan to be more or less unfunded as we only have about a million dollars guaranteed to us annually um, through a funding source from the state of California. So in order to implement our bike plan, we need to find different ways to leverage resources. We need to go after grant funding. Some of the city programs that we align uh, our bike plan implementation with include our pavement maintenance program, uh, Vision Zero projects, and similar to the Blossom Hill 101 example, regional highway projects. We also go after a lot of competitive grant funding and finally, we work with private development. Um, we can condition some developments to build out parts of our bike network. And when there's major projects such as Downtown West or City View Plaza, um, these, these developers can build out a lot of our network. Um, on the right uh, is the status of our five-year priority projects. It's the map from the previous slide updated with its current status. And you can see what's completed, what's funded, and what's unfunded. I'll mention that the map is slightly misleading as some of these corridors are much more difficult than others to implement. So though, though it appears to be halfway completed, um, I would say it's far from. This gives you a, a, a sense of where we are. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, before we go continue with this agenda item, there's a little bit of book of housekeeping to do um, related to AB 2449. Um, we need a motion. Since, since it was late notice on the uh, virtual attendance from Councilmember Davis, we need a motion to approve um, her attendance under AB 2449 remotely. So do I have a motion? So move to approve attendance. Second. Second. All right. We'll just take a vote. I guess the four of us since it has to be approved before she can vote on it. <laughs> so roll call. Candelas? Yes. Ortiz? Aye. Cooley? Aye. And Cohen? Aye. Thank you. And uh, Councilmember Davis, I have to ask under AB 2449 uh, if there's anyone in the room with you over the age of 18. There is not. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Back, to, you, the, uh, back to the agenda. We have, we'll go to public comment. Blair? Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks a lot for this item. Uh, good description of how of the current state of the programs, uh, how programs are going. Um, it's my feeling that um, uh, I guess just a few reminders that um, the VTA is also they complement this sort of work that you're doing in, in San Jose on these bike projects. Uh, and of course, that uh, the work I do with tech accountability, uh, you're going to be building some surveillance uh, around these trails and public safety issues and the importance of public safety and, uh, you know, the future of surveillance to develop really good accountable policies and practices with the technology, the surveillance tech that will be around these sort of projects. Uh, it's a real important part of the future of this process. It's not just uh, getting a bunch of technology, it's making sure the technology has good open public policies and accountable practices. That's the key to our future of sustainability and how to really build the community harmony ideas, the vision zero basically. And so really good luck on those efforts. 
Um, the city of Davis up by Sacramento has some uh, really good examples of how they work the surveillance and technology ordinance uh, with wildlife trail issues, in fact. So uh, as always, I always try to mention that for items like this. And uh, I guess just a reminder that for all this good uh, vertical north-south work you've done on this item that's been very interesting, a real good luck how we tried in the past eight years to talk about east-west uh, bike trails and the importance of those concepts. I'm really interested how that can develop here in the next uh, you know, few years and to continue the work of the past. It's tough work, but I think it can accomplish something really interesting. Thank you. Back to the committee. All right. Uh, we'll start with Councilmember Foley. Great. Thank you so much for the presentation. I have a couple of questions for you. One is with regards to Bascom Avenue. You mentioned the work on Bascom Avenue was going to be impacting D6, but what is the status of Bascom Avenue complete streets and when is that going to be to materialize because that then will come down into D9 and others. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, so the Bascom Avenue Complete Streets Project for people who are, are newer is a partnership that VTA started with the cities of San Jose and Campbell and the County of Santa Clara because Bascom goes through all of those jurisdictions and VTA rightly saw the need to help coordinate so we didn't have scattershot approaches throughout the corridor. And so a uh, really exciting milestone is that through the most recent active transportation program call, uh, VTA submitted with our support for Bascom Avenue for more than $30 million and is receiving that. Yay. So we are really excited that they're moving forward, you know, with that, with our you know, partnership for the whole corridor. They had already, um, put in Measure B dollars to get the project moving in terms of the environmental and the early design, and then the um, state money that's just coming in will, uh, we certainly hope, fully fund the construction. That's what it's slated to do. So the funding we just, we are receiving will complete the complete street project for Bascom. That is exactly what it will do. Now there are um, different steps, right, in that process. VTA is just working with a kind of designer to finish the design and the environmental, and then we'll be able to move forward to, to bidding it out and seeing the construction. That will take a number of years. In the meantime, some things that the city is working with VTA on are um, the quick strike pieces that can be done without all of that major construction, uh, but that won't have to be redone. It's being coordinated so that that will stay in place. And then also you will see that um, there's a, a new uh, protective signal for light rail at Bascom near Hamilton, just north of Hamilton, mm -hmm. um, that we also got funded through the uh, federal Chrissy grade crossing improvement program uh, that we're implementing. So that these all these puzzle pieces can fit together along Bascom. Okay, and thank you. That's really great news. What kind of outreach has been done or will be done? Because that's, and, and my office is very willing to help. We have a lot of interested people who will be very <laughs> concerned and want to know what's happening with Bascom yeah. as we have some development actually occurring on that street. Right, exactly. So in 2017-18, Ramses, do you want to answer this one? So the, originally, uh, the outreach happened through the actual development of the complete streets plan itself. Um, and that was in 20. Before my time. Before your time. <laughs> um, uh, and there were walk audits and, and quite a lot of, of outreach at that time to develop the plan. Um, and since then, uh, so once that's, that was adopted by VTA, um, uh, it then became an officially adopted plan. Um, and VTA has been working on the design um, in the last uh, couple of years to get us there. And as part of that design process, there has been continued outreach um, uh, within the communities uh, for that. Um, I, yeah, anything to add? Yeah, just to, you know, very succinctly, you know, we find that as a, during the planning process, the community input is the most integral in shaping the fundamentals, right? So that's what Ramses is talking about with the VTA Complete Street Study. There were open questions. Do you want this? Do you want this? What direction do you want to go? Mm -hmm. And then as the project progresses, we go from broad engagement 
to input into more specific features to information to the public about kind of how this is going to take shape. We also, through that early process, were able to align that with ur urban village work that the city had done so that that was kind of, I think, from the public seen as like one process rather than multiple. But, but I will say, you know, as a project takes shape, that, that 30 million is for very specific line items in construction. So there's kind of more and more outreach, less and less engagement, if you will. Thank you. And I'll, I'll follow up with you uh, around that specific issue, because I know that's not really on the agenda, but you mentioned Bascom, and it set me in the direction of the complete streets. Um, also, you did mention Pearl, and you showed pictures of Pearl. I'm curious if those three people on bikes were actually neighbors who were on bikes, or were those stage DOT people in bicycles? Because I can tell you my residents are not all that happy, although I was 100% behind it and support it. So any, if any of my residents are listening, you have me to blame because it's all about slowing down traffic and making the streets safe for, all, for pedestrians and, and travelers. Two of those people were staged. <laughs> that is correct. They happened Thank to you for live, your honesty. They happened to live nearby, and one of the folks rode up and said, hey, what are you doing? I love the project. I would love to be in this photograph. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm so happy with the project. Uh, and just a couple of weeks ago, there was actually an accident nearby of someone running a stop sign or stop light in that area right by the school. We have a couple of elementary schools in that, or schools in that area. And that's one of the main reasons we narrowed the street. Pearl is a fast street. A lot of people use it as a loop to avoid other traffic, and they can't do that anymore. So I'm very happy about that, although my residents are not so much. So that's too bad. The last question I had is, <laughs> it's not too bad. I do listen to my residents, but your safety is the most important thing if you're out there listening to me. Because um, someone's going to pick that up and say, they shouldn't care. That's not true. Anyway, um, <laughs> right? Am I right? Um, about, <laughs> about the trails, um, we get comments from people who like to ride their bikes on the trails, but they're concerned about their safety. What are we doing to keep the trails free of debris, free of, uh, and able for people to pass through safely? Thank you for the question, I can answer that. Um, so in CD9 specifically, we did just implement deterrence at Chinoweth along the Guadalupe <laughs> River Trail and also deterrence at Silker, right by the Silker Park. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Jess. Yeah. Uh, so v by v deterrent, I'm talking about vehicle deterrents such as bollards, boulders, uh, fences, gates to prevent private vehicles from accessing, but that can also be removed so that maintenance vehicles can come through to care for the trails. Um, in the city of San Jose, we're really trying, we're working very hard to connect our trails um, because in the past we have seen that when trails are connected, disuse is lessened. Um, disuse tends to really congregate at dead ends. Mm -hmm. So in, in CD, in Council District 9 specifically, as you know, we're working to connect the Guadalupe River Trail up to Branham and then to Capitol and then all the way to downtown to hopefully reduce uh, the disuse along that trail. Does that answer your question? It does, but it wasn't just specific to District 9. It was really uh, throughout the city of San Jose. You hear, we hear about uh, people wanting to ride along near the Guadalupe, Guadalupe Park corridor and concerns about uh, safety. So okay. do we have sheriffs or police patrolling or what kind of, yes. or park? People. Thank you. Yes. Um, so we have implemented a couple of new pilot projects that I believe, so this is through our Parks Department, um, but I believe they're being extended beginning this year, maybe around this summertime. Um, the first pilot program was Police Officers on Bikes, um, and that was along the Coyote Creek Trail, and that is going to be extended to the Guadalupe River Trail um, as well. And then we also have implemented a project called the Trail Safety um, Team, 
I believe that's what it's called. And that's, that consists of our conservation corps. And uh, it's, it's, they're being managed by our rangers. And they, um, they also are on bikes, on the trails, cleaning up debris and doing light landscaping where our maintenance staff have not been able to. And that's usually in our, um, in our more dis, I don't wanna say disused, in our heavier used trails, so like along the Guadalupe, along the Coyote Creek, um, some, some sections of the Las Gatas Creek, um, and stuff like, stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, great, that's, that's actually good news. I, I appreciate that report, and great. thank you all. With that, I will move acceptance of the report. Second. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Ortiz. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chairman. I uh, definitely wanna start out by thanking staff uh, for this extremely important work. Um, uh, at the root of all this, I believe, is public safety, especially in, in regards to transportation, and we're all very much aware of how, or at least just the loss of life uh, uh, in our major corridors, um, so I can't understate uh, you know, just how important this is. So thank you so much for um, this work. You know, uh, The safety of our, our residents should be our, one of our main priorities. Um, so really, really excited to all the all the projects that are going through. Um, uh, I know that this is going to be a great addition to our, our city as we try to push towards uh, getting people out on their bikes, getting out of cars, things like that, which I'm also supportive of. Um, I just uh, I had a question because I, I did do a trail clean a, a, um, one trail cleanup in my district the other day, and one of the there's also a bike group and they're they're really interested in the Lower Silver Creek Trail. Has there been discussions on, I know that the last plan I think that was uh, put into place was 2007. Has there been any discussions since then of what this may look like? Because I know there's a lot of you know, concerns about safety. There has been you know, gang activity and drug activity on that trail. Um, so I, I think any sort of uh, insight I could get, and we could always have a, a briefing uh, after this, but that I could share with them would be great. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, there is, uh, there, the plan has not been updated. I believe you're talking about the master plan for the Lower Silver Creek yeah. Trail from 2007. Yeah. That has not been updated, but we do have a list of priorities for those segments beginning up near the Kellogg factory, near the intersection of Lower Silver Creek and Coyote Creek Trail. Um, and I'm, there are various, um, it's prioritized not only because of based on the continuity of trail, but also based on the likelihood that a trail will be possible in certain areas because of right of way. Um, but I'm, I'm more than happy to set up a meeting to give you a briefing. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, that'd be all. All right, thank you, Member Count. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Candelas. Uh, thank you. Um, I too wanna thank staff for their presentation. Um, I've, I've had, uh, the privilege of serving on several trail advocacy boards throughout my life, whether it was Five Wounds Trail or Save Our Trails. Um, I, think it's, I think it's critical, um, not just for our, our residents to, um, to enjoy recreationally, but it's, it, if we wanna move our GHG reduction targets, this is how we do it. Um, because that's how we move people safely from one place of the city to the, to the other. Uh, I, I couldn't help but to see on one of the slides the, uh, the trail network currently you know, uh, as it stands, um, and you know, I see District 8 Evergreen in the far right corner, and there's, there's little or no infrastructure out, the, out there. I know T Thompson Creek is something that we're gonna be finishing up soon, and I'm super excited to do uh, something to, to bring attention to the community so they know that it's open, um, especially because it's gonna be a critical component to uh, connecting folks to Lake Cunningham, uh, which I know uh, my colleagues on, on the council care, care about as well. And, and, and to that note, I, I too want to echo my, uh, my council member or colleagues' uh, thoughts on Silver Creek Trail. I think that's, uh, in order to move residents in my district from uh, one far corner to you know, transportation lines, whether it's VTA, Caltrain, mm -hmm. uh, the future BART, um, I think we need, to, we need to think about those very difficult connectors because if it was easy, it would have already been done. Um, and so we need to put very, very concise um, and, and, and thoughtful effort into to, to making sure we, we can do that, not just for you know, us on the council, but for the residents of our district who actually need, need it to get uh, to and from. So 
Um, that being said, I, 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 I'm, I'm excited to see the progress, especially I know Five Wounds Trail, um, the easement acquisition is, is coming before us soon, I think, because I'm still on the mail list. Terry Christensen will not let it go, and, and, I, and I, I will not let him uh, uh, not remind me. So uh, thank you. Keep up the good work, and, and thank you for the report. Okay, thank you so much for the questions. I have a few questions. As you can imagine, my questions will move us a little north. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I saw your, your discussion on the Coyote Creek Trail and the connection from Watson Park to BART. Is this, is this utilizing Mabry as the crossing, Mabry as the crossing, or is there going to be another way to get over 101? So the, the current segment of trail that is funded by the Active Transportation Program does um, go under 101 along the creek, but it does uh, end at Mayberry. Now the the um, flea market development is also conditioned to then continue the trail, but there is a 90% sure, and we can correct if I'm, if I'm wrong on this memory, that it does use Mayberry to cross at grade with the currently funded segment. So you're saying that the trail, though, will come out on the east side of 101, already having crossed 101. It's not going to rely on 101 as the crossing. Uh, Mayberry as the crossing over 101. Right? Correct. Yes, I'm sorry. So you will you will cross Mayberry Road at grade, but you will already have gone under right. 101 okay. to connect to the correct side. Yeah, yeah, that'll be exciting to have that yeah. more direct. And there's already the trail through the BART station that's yeah. north of that. It's just yeah. a question of getting, exactly. getting there. Um, the east-west yeah. is an issue, obviously, across many of these highways. 101, 880 in the north part of the city. Um, not really good, safe ways to get across 880, particularly as we go further north. I saw in the report the central bikeway, which is Maybury over to Heading and then across. But there was also talk about a more northern bikeway that would connect through to North San Jose. Is that still um, being discussed? We have general direction that we take very seriously to look for more and better east-west crossings of both the natural features like the creeks and the rivers as well as the highways and it's it's that combination of those barriers and the fact that the creeks do run north south um, primarily uh, that has led us to have so many fewer east-west options than we do north south so a couple ways in which we're looking at how to cross specifically in that North San Jose area across 880. One of them is we are per the settlement agreement moving forward with the county and VTA to advance the series of projects along Montague and we're going to look for the best possible bikeway connections that are either part of that roadway or adjacent to it but that remains it's an early feasibility step that we're looking at what those options you know could be. Um, secondly, we are starting the North San Jose Transportation Plan, um, and so just let Ramses give a preview of that. Thank you, Jess. Yeah, as you know, we're kicking off the North San Jose Multimodal Transportation Improvement Plan, which is specifically going to be looking at that, that kind of North First Street corridor and how do we get across there. Right, and, and um, there's already some good recommendations actually coming out of the Rose Fellowship quite a few years ago at this point, uh, making sure we're making better connections there, but we'll actually have the, the planning resources to really dig in now and say, all right, you know, we've got this bike plan, we've got a, a few different east-west tracks, which are the ones we should be prioritizing? Everything from Tasman all the way at the north, where we actually have some pretty advanced planning already, um, uh, uh, but we need to look at further down, um, all the way down that corridor to kind of figure those things out. Um, Brokaw is even one of the ones, right, that you've, that you've been involved in as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask about Brokaw next, but uh, I, I think the, the Mabry, 101, Mabry 880 interchange lends itself to something just like we're doing at Trimble 101 and Blossom Hill 101 with a separated bike overcrossing as part of that overall project. Of course, that's years out and, and a lot of money, but it's going to come, and, and that'll be probably the best way to get across when that's done. Um, I would argue probably that the Tasman corridor is the safest and best route. Obviously, a lot of it goes through Milpitas. A portion goes through Milpitas and then back into San Jose. But if we do that, think about that connectivity corridor. Is there any way, do we ever coordinate then across jurisdiction with a city like Milpitas to make sure that that's? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. So the, the Tasman plan was actually just like the Bascom plan we were talking about earlier, was a multi-jurisdictional uh, complete streets effort led by VTA, which we were a party to. 
um, and very happy it was done. Um, and so that plan actually goes all the way from the Great Mall through Milpitas, through San Jose, through Santa Clara, through Sunnyvale, where uh, the road kind of dissipates into an, a, a, a general um, a residential neighborhood. Um, and so there's actually plans across the entire corridor to kind of up the, up the biking game um, there. Yeah, when I biked to North San Jose, I think Tasman was the, clearly ended up being the, the most, the, the, the most enjoyable of the routes and the safest of the routes. So we, we ought to keep it that way. Um, Brokaw worries me. I'm not sure there's a solution. I saw on your map Brokaw being a future improvement between Oakland Road and Zanker, but it's not clear to me how we really get anybody safely underneath 880 there. The road's narrows. It's there's not a lot of space, but. I don't know if you have yeah. any thoughts. No, we'll, we'll always look for improvement possibilities um, with every time we either repave or look for grant funding. But there are, there are more constraints at these key points, like where you have a fixed highway infrastructure or a fixed infrastructure over a creek, like in that situation. And John knows that I've been saying that we need to actually widen in that interchange, but that's another major project for the future. Um, just one of the other questions, last question, about the quick build separation. We did one along uh, Hostetter Brokaw. Um, I've still had a lot of people tell me they don't feel comfortable. Um, it's a, still a fast road. Cars are still using the bike lane to turn right at all the interchanges along the way, so cars are pulling in front of people. Do we do any kind of surveying or studying of these streets after this is done to see what additional improvements need to be done to make it safer for bicyclists? Thank you. We have an evaluation program that has been uh, getting kind of incrementally resourced over the past few years, and it has been doing, uh, where possible, before and after studies. Um, surveys can be part of that, but are not always reliable for, you know, just given the context of a particular area. So those studies so far are focusing more on speeds before and after, volumes of users of different types of, of modes uh, before and after as, you know, as well as other, um, you know, data that speaks to collision data, of course, as well, data that speaks to both the usage and the safety. So I think surveys, um, you know, I, I can think of a couple places where that's been used, intercept surveys or others, but it has not been uh, kind of a must do in every location. I'll add just a little bit there. You know, these are quick build projects that we specifically do intend to go back to, right, um, and then make them into permanent solutions, right? And, and the one that we're spending the most time in doing exactly that on right now is San Fernando uh, from, the, from the station um, all the way to the university here, right? And, you know, we do those studies at that point uh, pretty intensely. Um, and also what we do is we learn a lot from the geometry we put out there. Right, so are cars getting in front of bikes in a certain way that we thought we had blocked? Um, are there certain uh, uh, places where we need to, you know, push the concrete a little further out to slow the cars down just that much more so they'll actually, you know, give bikes a safe environment? Those kinds of things we're learning through those environments. So the quick build, in a way, sets up a, a test environment where we think we've done our best already in the design, but we always know there's ways to improve. And then when we get to come back and we get that money to do the, the permanent version of it, we do do quite a bit of, of, of in-depth design research and, and, and user um, research at that point. Yeah, it occurs to me that we might need a better reporting system to hear from people. You know, we don't, we, obviously if there's really collisions, then we find out about them, likely we do. Um, but we, we don't really encourage people to report near misses or other things that happen to them along the way. And maybe we would think about creating a portal where people can say, hey, this happened to me while on my bike ride. And, and get it into the system somewhere so we can keep count of where things are happening. All right, I think that's it. Any other questions from my colleagues? All right, I guess we'll move to a vote then. Candelas? Aye. Ortiz? Foley? Aye. Davis? Yes. And Cohen? Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the report. Brings us to uh, the next item, which is a residential garbage cart pilot. Uh, we're happy to see our, our friends from ESD. And we're always excited to talk trash. So uh, we'll let Carrie kick us off when she gets her seat. It, 
Thank you, Carrie Romano, Director of Environmental Services, um, joined today by Deputy Director Valerie Osmond. Deputy <laughs> Valerie leads our solid waste programs, and then um, by Senior Environmental Program Manager Jeff Anderson. I don't know if you guys have met Jeff before, but Jeff's been with the city for 24 years, all of those with ESD and all of those doing garbage and recycling. So um, he's the guy that really kind of gets us to, to where we are today. And uh, we're super thankful that he's still here and uh, still smiling. So, uh, with, uh, so today our first topic is a garbage cart pilot. You've heard us refer to this, I think, a couple times over the last several years, really looking at what kinds of things we can try out to improve our overall programmatic performance. Um, as you may recall, and you'll certainly hear in the next topic, um, our garbage programs, particularly residential, are funded solely by ratepayers. And so when we make a move, we want to make sure it makes sense. And so we tend to do a lot of pilots and a lot of testing of things because we are such, such a large city. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Valerie. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, first we're going to cover some general information about the Residential Garbage and Recycling Program. It's one of the largest privatized residential solid waste programs in the country, serving all San Jose households. Our program is a leader in the industry by diverting waste from landfills, having positive impacts on greenhouse gases and climate, having innovative programs and pilots placing us ahead of the curve on many fronts, and this is achievable through our strong partnerships with our service providers. San Jose has four service providers that serve our residents. From the map on the slide, you can see that California Waste Solutions collects and processes single-family recycling in Districts A and C. Garden City Sanitation collects single-family garbage in Districts A and C. Green Team collects single-family garbage and recycling in District B, multi-family dwellings citywide, along with city facilities garbage and recycling. Green Waste collects yard trimmings citywide, processes single-family, multi-family, and city facilities garbage, and collects and processes citywide public litter can waste. Unique to San Jose, we have year-round unlimited loose in the street yard trimmings collection, unlimited recycling collection, unlimited large junk pickup collection at no additional charge to our residents, which is a very successful program and is collected by California Waste Solutions and Green Team. And our residential garbage is sorted by green waste to recover recyclables and organic, such as food waste and compostable paper. That's sent for composting. Um, that process is also referred to as back-end processing or mixed waste processing. We have an approximate $183 million annual budget. So a little history about San Jose's residential program. Our curbside recycling program started in 1993 with a four-sort system. And you can see an image of the plastic crates that we used to use from that system in the lower left-hand corner. At the same time, we initiated a pay-as-you-throw system designed to encourage recycling. And it's a, raised, a rate that is based solely on your garbage service level. In 2002, the city moved to a commingled one-container recycling system, which increased tons collected. And you can see that in the image at the top of the screen. In 2008, the city started processing multifamily garbage to remove organics, which were then composted. In 2014, built on the success of the multifamily garbage processing, we started processing single-family waste as well. In 2019, outreach responsibilities transferred from our contractors to the city. We implemented the Recycle Right Outreach Campaign, an extensive trilingual campaign to reduce recycling contamination. Lastly, in 2021, the city amended and restated the agreements with all four of its service providers through 2036. One major change was a dynamic pricing structure where recycling contractors were compensated more as recycling contamination increased. Starting in 2020, studies are conducted every two years to, to determine contamination levels. The curbside recycling studies showed a sharp increase in recycling contamination from 32% in 2015 to 51% in 2020. This increase was thought to be due to COVID-19 shelter-in-place orders because residents were generating more waste while schooling and working from home. Staff also wondered if the steep price increase in the pay-as-you-throw rate 
structure was causing people to subscribe to less garbage service than is needed. 85% of single-family homes subscribe to the smallest size garbage cart available, which is 32 gallons. The larger garbage cart pilot was developed to test to see if there's a correlation between garbage cart size and recycling contamination. In July 2022, approximately 4,200 homes were offered a 96-gallon garbage cart at no additional charge to test if providing a larger garbage cart would reduce recycling contamination. Routes were chosen by contamination rates, location, route coordination between our garbage and recycling service providers, the number of homes per route, and we also made sure to include a route that received new recy recycling cart lids as part of a separate pilot from spring 2021. Some additional information is that we had about 10% of participants who opted out, and the opt-out reasons were um, the larger garbage carts were either too heavy, um, too large to roll out to the curb, or they didn't generate enough garbage to require the larger cart. Third-party recycling contamination studies have shown that contamination has increased in the recent years, as shown in this chart. This chart focuses only on what residents place in their gray cart with a blue lid. Between 2015 and 2020, overall recycling contamination increased by almost 20 percentage points. The consultant doing the study at the time surmised that this increase was due largely to COVID-19 shelter-in-place orders and provided an estimate of what they thought contamination would look like without shelter-in-place orders, as shown in the second column. However, the most recent study conducted in fall 2022 showed that overall citywide contamination increased yet again to 57%, despite the lifting of shelter-in-place orders. This seemed to indicate that higher contamination may be the new normal. As compared to overall citywide contamination, contamination on the larger garbage cart pilot routes actually improved. This chart shows that all five routes saw recycling contamination reductions from six percentage points up to nearly 30 percentage points for Route 543 on the far right of the chart. Despite these improvements, the contamination levels on four of the five routes were still above the average, uh, citywide average of 57%. So in addition to the third party study, staff also did an analysis of collected tons and visual assessments of the cart contents. The tonnage analysis showed that cart garbage tons increased and recycling decreased. And that confirms what the third party study had said, that residents were shifting material into the appropriate cart. Staff also did visual assessments of the carts before and after the pilot, looking at cart contents, as well as checking for overflowing garbage carts, a problem when residents do not subscribe to the appropriate level of garbage service. The visual assessments showed that while overflowing garbage carts were largely eliminated, Visual assessments of contamination were less conclusive, showing improvements in some areas, but worsening contamination in others. And in the images on the slide, which were not staged, <laughs> you can see some of the contents we discovered in the recycling carts. Staff also conducted trilingual surveys to obtain qualitative information on their, lar on their larger garbage cart pilot experience. At the end of February, and. Um, sorry, at the end of January and early February, all participants were mailed a postcard to take a trilingual online survey. Staff also conducted in-person trilingual canvassing during this time, reaching about 40 residents in person. We received 259 survey responses, um, about 227 of those were in English, 25 in Spanish, and 7 Vietnamese. And 77% of respondents felt their experience was good or excellent. Most selected that their recycling and garbage carts were about three quarters full. The majority of respondents said that they sometimes use the extra space in the larger garbage cart, while about a quarter of respondents said that they always use it. Most indicated an interest in keeping their larger garbage cart after the pilot, but cited the cost increase as being a challenge. Staff have submitted two budget proposals for consideration this, fiscal, this coming fiscal year. 
So due to the inconclusive results of the pilot and continued problems with recycling contamination, staff will continue to gather data and research best practices to better understand how potential program changes could help to reduce contamination. This includes a plan to expand the garbage cart pilot, which will provide a larger sample size to more confidently estimate the anticipated effects of larger garbage carts were deployed citywide. Staff has also submitted a budget proposal to provide direct recycling cart feedback, utilizing a team of field staff to conduct visual assessments and provide feedback to residents on recycling cart contents through an attached tag. Additionally, ESD will continue to expand efforts to educate residents to keep food and liquids out of recycling so they don't soil clean recyclables, including increasing the installation of new recycling cart lids with proven effective trilingual English, Spanish, and Vietnamese labels showing what is and what is not recyclable. With these expanded efforts, staff will better understand how to combat the problem of recycling contamination throughout the city. The image at the bottom of this slide shows the new recycling cart lid that was installed at about 5,000 single family residents um, last spring in 2021 during that recycling cart lid pilot. And the pilot also showed some positive improvement on reducing recycling contamination. So um, in summary, I just wanted to clarify that when we say contamination, some of what we mean is garbage in the, in the recycling cart, but some of it is also things like wet cardboard. So materials that it's the right material in the right cart, but it got damaged by something else. So some of it is a sorting issue and some of it is a quality of material. So we want the, um, we want the jar, but not the jar with spaghetti sauce in it, right? So, um, so that's where we talk a lot about clean and dry recyclables. So it's a little bit of a complex topic. And um, Jeff, if we were to move everyone to large garbage carts, we would need how many? 100,000, something like that? Uh, 200,000, yeah. Yeah, so we don't want to buy 200,000 larger carts if we don't know that it's going to... Um, not only improve our environmental performance, but again, the, as we'll talk in the next topic, because of the new um, cost sharing, risk sharing methodology you have with our haulers, we want to make sure result, result, that expenditure results in reduced rates. So, um, so that's why we're not recommending we just go forward. So with that, we're, oh, and we also gave you all some stickers up there. Um, and those are the stickers at, a bit smaller that, uh, that are uh, similar to the ones that are on the new carts. Uh, cart lids that do have shown um, have shown results and would love to give you some more and uh, help spread the word these have been mailed to ratepayers so uh, so every everyone should have received one but uh, we're happy to give out more and with that we're available for questions thank you uh, for that update um, we've been kind of waiting for a little while to hear about this study so I'm, I'm glad to see it and, I, and I'm glad you clarified a little bit about what contamination means because I was going to ask that question about, I mean, there, there's multiple levels. There's also the contamination of people who are, think, who are wish cycling, right, who think that they're recycling and throwing a plastic that's not a recyclable plastic in with other plastics. Is that, is that counted as well in the, in the contamination question? So if the material is not a pro, an identified program material, if it's something that shouldn't be in there or it's in there of the wrong quality, that's considered contamination. So not the best word for it, but, um, but yes, if, um, if you put something just thinking, oh, the city will know what to do with it, maybe it's recyclable, like a, a piece of, uh, like a kid's toy or something, right. um, then yes, that's considered contamination. Yeah. And I think it's gotten more complicated for all of us in terms of the rules, because we keep hearing conflicting messages about just scrape and throw in the recycling, and then also sometimes you have to clean it. So it's not even clear yeah. to those of us who talk about this what the right way to do it is. And some of the recycling, not all, not all contamination is equal, because if you go to a separation system and it's clean contamination, you can separate it. It doesn't have an effect. But dirty contamination actually reduces the value of the recyclable. So there's multiple levels, I assume. You can see our challenge with behavior change and outreach to the community. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I, yeah. I didn't see any public comment. Are there is there any public comment on this? There's no hands up. Okay, so we'll go over to Councilmember Foley. Thank you for the presentation. So, and uh, thank you for the chair's comments. It just led me into a 
kind of a spin about what's recyclable, what's not recyclable, what's dirty, what's not dirty. I was at a presentation at a neighborhood association and uh, someone from your department was there, Carrie, with, and handed us all these rubber spatulas and said, this is all you need to do is take the can, clean it out, and put it in recycling. It's not clean completely. It's still right. dirty. And so I struggle with that. I think, well, wait a minute. It's dirty. So now I'm taking this can of soup or whatever. I've cleaned it out. It's still dirty. And I'm tossing it in with the recycle, recyclable. It just doesn't sit well with me. So tell me once and for all that I'm okay. That's okay. <laughs> or it's, that it's not. Um, it depends. Uh, so, so if you see the problem, right? Well, well. So here, here's the test that we, here's the way we try to explain to folks is if you turn the container upside down and nothing spills out, it's clean enough. Because predominantly, what's happening is the paper, the cardboard and the paper products in the cart are getting damaged by the food waste, and so, um, so it's sort of like we've moved now from if in doubt, put it in recycling to if in doubt, put it in garbage, because we're sorting the garbage part as well. And so, um, so, but before we put that message out in the public purview, we really, we don't wanna have too many mixed messages. So that's where we're aligning over the next year to, um, to kind of figure out what makes sense. But in general, it's the liquids and the food that are damaging the cardboard. While we don't like microwaves and other things, they're really not damaging anything else. Right, I understand. So uh, just to follow up with my can of soup analogy, I have this thing, I don't want to put yeah. it in my recycling yet, so I rinse it out. Therefore, it's wet. Then I put it in recycling, and that causes wetness in the can. So now I'm thinking maybe that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. And during the drought, which I realize we may or may not be, depending on who you ask, yeah. I didn't want to do that because of the use of the water in that. So am I okay with that strategy? Yep, so you make your soup, you scrape out the container, you rinse it if you want to. As long as you turn it upside down, nothing's dripping out, you can go ahead and, and put it in the recycle bin. Okay, so I'm gonna have to get that out to my community. And one, one other thing, I'm actually going to invite you or your team. I have a, uh, an event coming up, Music in the Valley, and you have an, a, a, a recycle booth coming. It'd be really great if you had samples of, this is our bins, this is what you do for this one, this is what you do for that, I mean, really uh, interactive, place that they can, the residents who come by can see how they're really supposed to be doing it. And who's really gonna be paying attention are the kids. Because the kids want mom and dad to do it right. They get it, they get the lessons at school and they wanna come home and show their mom and dads what they need to do. So they're gonna come around and look at our recycling booth that we have set up for you. So if you could have it interactive, it would be really awesome. And I think this is great but I still have lots of questions about what's recyclable and not. And, and we're you know, sort of in the know, but we're, we're really not. Um, bottom line is that this, the pilot wasn't conclusive, is what you're saying. It wasn't. More, it, it wasn't. It didn't reduce the contamination it, in the recycling bins. It, it, it did. I mean, recycling uh, improvement is the long game, right? So we did see a bit, a bit of improvement. And remember, we attacked the most contaminated routes because that's where we're going to see the biggest strides. Right. Um, and so, so I feel like it did produce results, but they weren't compelling enough for me to say, let's go buy 200,000 carts and change the whole, the whole system. But, but we do think it's going in, um, in the right direction, but we're still not certain about the COVID effect. And, um, and I just don't think it's, it's stable enough to say, let's pivot now. Um, but I think another year, we'll, our confidence will be at the point that we'll be able to make a recommendation that we feel we can say, if we do this, it will result in this. Wonderful. Thank you. With that, uh, thank you. I appreciate the report. Uh, with that, I will move to accept the report. Second. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Foley. Actually, that's a great suggestion about the interactive uh, demonstrations. Uh, even, even having people come up and, and do the thing right there on site and say, where should this one go and how would you clean it and, and actually 
see if they get it right. Um, I think that's the only, I was just thinking that those of us who have been on this committee for two plus years and have been hearing these presentations and asking these questions still aren't ever sure when we're home whether we're doing it right. There's no way that the average resident will ever know. Um, so I think the only way it could actually work is if, is if their garbage rates include like one visit a year from a concierge who comes to their house and recycles with them for an hour. <laughs> because otherwise, there's, I don't see how people are going to know what's the right thing to do. Um, am I right in though, in, in the contamination issue is really most important on paper? Am I right in that? It has the biggest impact because obviously we can clean off glass and, um, and aluminum much more readily. Yeah, you, could, you can take but, contaminated glass and aluminum, as you've already said, and it still gets recycled. Yep, J Jeff, anything to add to that? No. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, we used to have separate bins for paper. We've gone away from that, and it seems like it's led to these kind of problems. I'm always frustrated in my house because I have people throwing the, we have a kitchen recycling can, people put paper in there. I take every piece of paper out and keep it in a separate can, at least until I then mix it all together on Thursday night in the garbage in the recycling can. I don't see any way to prevent contamination because there's going to be something wet, something with some dirt on it. Rain gets in those, those, those recycling cans when in the rainy season. I just don't see, unless we have separate paper stream, how we're going to do this. Are we thinking about this as a, as a solution? We are. Recall our current contracts go through 2036. And so we would start the bid process for new contracts. We probably have something on the street by 2030. So that sounds like a long time, but, but it's actually not because we have to figure out, we have to design a new program. So we're spending the, that time between now and 2029 figuring out what the program should be. Um, because at this point, we couldn't add, we couldn't add a third bin in a cost-effective way because it would require additional trucks, um, 200,000 additional carts, um, and a lot of behavior change. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't maybe some isolated places where it could make sense. Um, so that's where we're down this path of if we could get larger garbage carts, does it help solve, um, solve what we can solve given the constraints of the existing system? Um, or is... Um, you know, are there things we sh more things we should say we don't recycle um, here and then simply take the paper and cardboard, put it all in the garbage bin and use it for compost. So, um, so lots of different ways to, um, to get there. My team hates that idea. But, uh, but lots, you feel the stare. Lots of, uh, lots of different ideas, though, on how to, how to make change in the, uh, the 10 years we have left. And I, I don't actually mind the idea of saying let's put everything in the garbage, if we're, we are separating our garbage, um, and exactly. it's got the same technology that separates contamination and non-contamination. So let's tell people. Let, let's consider this idea of telling people only put really clean things in recycling, and everything else goes in garbage. But then we have a can size issue. So right. anyway, exactly. Yeah. But, I mean, my interest has always been in maximizing recycling, and and so I get, we got to hope to get there. Um, so, yeah. but but thank you for the for the update and the work. I think we're done with comments, so we have a motion. Let's vote. Candelas? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Foley? Aye. Davis? And Cohen? Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, same team, I think, staying yeah. in the box. So we're moving on to our uh, garbage and recycling rates report. So if you thought the first topic was confusing, um, this one is a bit, a bit complex. Um, we're sort of starting at the beginning and, um, and working our, our, our storyline through where we are today. Um, but rates um, are obviously a very, very important part of our program. Um, and we are, um, we are uh, competitive in our rates, and we'll show you that. But, um, but the rate structure kind of drives the things we um, select to move forward and the things we don't select to move forward and uh, certainly the rates and compensation to our hauler partners are are um, a relevant part of the story as well because you know we need they, they actually do the work and so we want to make sure that we're um, not only charging our residents competitive rates but um, but compensating our partners uh, competitively as well so with that i'll turn it over to valerie thank you carrie All right, so residential garbage and recycling rates. 
Uh, we've talked a little bit about the city's four contracted haulers, and they provide service to 216,500 single-family homes every week and 118,400 multifamily households at least once a week. Services include garbage collection and processing and the collection of unlimited recycling, yard trimmings, and junk pickup. Our contracts with our four service providers total approximately $183 million annually. It's one of the largest privatized systems in the nation. And here we'd like to highlight that together, our contractors collect more than 500,000 tons of material per year. All of that material is collected, that is collected is sorted and processed before any non-recyclable materials are sent to landfill. Our residential garbage and recycling program is guided by the city's zero waste goal and waste, state waste diversion mandates. Staff engages with county and state peers and conducts pilots for programmatic improvements. Environmental Services has a comprehensive multilingual recycle right campaign to reduce recycling contamination. And our programs result in an overall residential diversion rate of 70%, one of the highest recycling rates in the country. The pay-as-you-throw structure was established in 1993, and most cities also use a pay-as-you-throw rate structure. The rate, based on gar the rate is based on garbage service level to encourage recycling, and 85% of our single-family homes subscribe to the smallest cart. And we believe this is because of the steep price increase difference between um, one garbage cart size to the next. San Jose has a very comprehensive program um, that we've mentioned, the garbage collection and processing, unlimited recycling, yard trimmings, used motor oil, junk pickup. We've also mentioned um, that we have provide most of these services and um, other cities do not necessarily offer the same level of service. Our program includes waste processing to recover organics where many other cities are needing to add this service in order to comply with SB 1383. Many other cities are needing to add containers, collection trucks, possibly contractors, um, which also adds to cost for their residents. You can see in this table that our rates are about in the middle for single family and very low for multifamily, and that we've included um, our proposed fiscal year 2023-2024 rates, and other ju jurisdictions' proposed rate increases are not yet known. In this chart, we're showing how our program expenditures play out and how our approximately $180 million annual operating budget is divided. The blue, green, and orange sections represent about 90% of our costs, which are tied to collection, processing, and disposal contracts. The remaining 10% is our administrative costs, and that covers about 4% for our very robust outreach program and about 6%, and that's all the contract management, city call center employees, finance staff, and other administrative costs. Um, it's still uh, considerably lower on the lower end than compared to other jurisdictions. There's a few things that impact our annual rates. For example, the refuse rate index, or RI, which is a cost of living adjustment, and um, this coming year it's an increase of 574 um, that's higher than usual, largely due to the fuel cost increases. Another example is recycling contamination. Through a dynamic pricing structure, contractors are paid more for higher recycling contamination, and since our citywide recycling contamination rate increased from 51% in 2020 to 57% in the latest study in 2022, it's increasing compensation to one of our recycling haulers by approximately $1 million. Our anticipated rate increases for fiscal year 2023-2024 are 4% for single family and 2% for multifamily. These are relatively low rate increases. Our prior five years single family increase has averaged about 4, I'm sorry, 8.4% each year. The largest increase in the last five years, which you can see in fiscal year 2021-22, was due to the impacts of the first year of our new extended contracts with all four haulers plus the impact of the first year of the dynamic recycling compensation. Rate notices are being sent to all property owners the first two weeks of April, and recommended rates go to Council on June 6th. That's it. 
And with that, we're available for questions. All right, thank you so much. Um, any public comment? Blair? Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. I guess uh, just to first to thank you that on the first item today, one of the uh, city staff persons, uh, Ryan, I think his name is, it was nice to hear him speak on the bicycle issues. Uh, I really like his comments when he when he's at the public presentations. Uh, hopefully he can be around again in the future at public presentation time. Uh, for this item, I wanted to comment that um, just a uh, thank you for it. Um, I, it's my hope that we are very much learning in this as we're trying to leave the era of COVID that it can just be easier and easier to talk about the importance of a uh, subsidy process and how that can help uh, persons of local neighborhoods when they have questions about their garbage rates and recycling rates and things that that you can talk to them and it, and it can be an open accessible and easy conversation. Uh, it, it takes time to learn how to do that and I, I just hope that my words can day, today can help be a reminder how to make that process uh, easier for all of us uh, in our future. Um, it's, a, it's an important subject matter and, and we have the, the means to work good subsidy programs at this time for garbage rates and recycling rates and uh, I, I just hope we don't have to be fearful that uh, we can talk about these things simply and openly uh, as a good community process. Thank you. Back to the committee. All right, uh, Councilmember Ortiz. Uh, thank you so much, Chairman. I had just a, a quick question, and depending on this answer, I may have others. But uh, in regards to the, the rate and the contract we're currently talking about with our, our service providers, are these the same services, uh, like when I see junk pickup, right? Is that the same as when someone sees uh, junk on the street and they put in 311 for them to pick it up? Uh, thank you for the question. No, so junk pickup is um, a part of the residential um, garbage and recycling service. And so Prop 218 requires that the rates we collect from um, rate payers benefit those rate payers equally. Mm -hmm. So the material that is um, picked up in illegal dumping is funded by the general fund. Oh, okay, so it's a separate contract altogether. Okay, thank you. I just wanted that clarification. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Councilmember Candelas. Thank you. Um, thanks, Dad, for the presentation. I, 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 I think one of the, the best things that, that we can do is, is uh, advertise for the illegal dump or the, the free junk pickup for, for, for residents. I know um, in, my, in my district, I get a lot of, um, a lot of uh, compliments on that program, especially as it's ramped up the last couple of years. Uh, one quick question. How long is the turnaround if, if a, a homeowner wants to request junk pickup to the moment that it actually gets picked up. What's the turnaround time that we're currently? Jeff, what's the contractual requirement? It's uh, usually a week to two weeks. Okay, awesome. And are we, are we meeting that, that target for the residents? Yes, our haulers are, are meeting it now. Oh, wonderful. That, that, that's great yep. to hear. Thank you so much. And just to, uh, to clarify, since I've used it a few times, I mean, it, the, 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 most of the turnaround is because, first of all, you have to wait for your day of the week because it only occurs on the day your garbage is picked up. And then... So you, you go online, you make an appointment for whichever week you're going to be able to get the thing to the to the curb, and you can be you can be the following week, or sometimes I wait a few weeks depending on how I want to do it, but it usually works pretty well. Yep, and I will share if you're really in a pinch calling, you can sometimes get a little faster than right. than the app. Um, yeah, I guess I've never been in that much of a hurry. What shocks me actually is people who take all the effort to strap stuff to the roof of their car and rent a U-Haul for, dumps, for dumpster days in our district when they can just pull it to the curb and let it get picked up by professionals. And we tell them and they still seem to like bringing stuff to the dumpster, but you know, it, we have to service, they're already paying for it. And they, don't, they end up waiting in line for an hour with a car loaded full of garbage. So I, I, I don't know, I, I haven't been able to figure it out. Just one question on that. What percentage of our customers have used that service in a typical year? Uh, Jeff and Valerie, I know you guys have. Um, we do look at it the, for the distribution um, district by district because one of our objectives is to ensure that there's um, 
relatively even participation throughout the city, and that helps focus our um, our outreach. But uh, Jeff, or Valerie, do you know about what percent? Trying to remember, not off the top of my head. And we, we do look at it at like who's used it at least once. Um, yeah. And some we have some heavier users who use it multiple times, and then we. I think we've looked at it over the course of two years as well, thinking that maybe somebody might use it, you know, one year but not the next. So it's usually around, I want to say roughly around 30% of our residents use oh, it. Oh, 30% is, have used it? Yeah, and that's, I think, um, just single family. Multi-family have it available as well, but um, participation is a little different depending on the complex. I, I was surprised it's that high, but it'd be great yeah. to know. I'd like to, the stats would be, we have 200,000 or so residential, single family home residential customers. So how many total pickups have there been and then how many unique pickup customers have there been? Yep. I think it would be interesting for us to know that. Because but I agree with Council Member Candelas. I think, I think uh, our, as our council offices promoting this could be, could be impactful. We have to continue to remind people that the service exists and that it's really easy. Um, and there's no reason, A, to wait for our next dumpster day or B, to dump it on the side of the road or over by the next, by the local homeless encampment, which is actually what also happens, or along the side of the highway. I mean, that's where, People are bringing their stuff rather than just bringing it to the sidewalk and getting it picked up there. We we have heard from um, a very small fraction of uh, the community, but it's probably more than we're hearing that um, for some folks it's uh, physically challenging for them to get the material from their home to the curb. So like you have new furniture delivered, but if you can't get it to the curb kind of thing. Um, so on my block, we just try and help each other. So if there's any way to weave that into the messaging mm -hmm. um, to you know ask for helping hand to get it out to the curb since there are restrictions on when you can put it out. Um, but we'd be happy to work with, I'm not gonna show up and help personally, everyone, <laughs> but, uh, but we'd be happy to, uh, to figure out how to weave that into our messaging as well. We all have staff for that, right? Um, no, but, but, but no, that's, I guess that's a good point. I mean, I, I, I was comparing it to people who actually load it onto a car and bring it to a dumpster, which seems like more work, right. but I, I, yeah. that's a reasonable uh, suggestion as well as help, neighbors should help each other. Um, just one more question. Whose responsibility is it when there's high contamination and the, and the recycling uh, provider has overages because of that? Do we have some contractual obligation to, I think I saw there was a million dollar, so, that, so we have some, who's responsible ultimately for losses incurred as a result of that? So, so the structure of the contract today, which is very different from where it was five years ago, is um, every two years we do a curbside audit, and if the contamination is up, we pay the hauler more as, an, as a way to um, reimburse them for the increased costs that, the, that they had to bear because of the contamination. And then um, there's going to be a day where it comes down, and then that payment would be reduced because they would no longer be bearing the excess costs of contamination. So, so far, it's, this is our second time it's only gone up. Um, we didn't foresee COVID uh, during the rate setting process, but you know, I think it did work out more, um, more fairly for our haulers because the reality is the contamination went up. And so they would have borne those costs. And so um, at least there was a mechanism in play to, um, to account for that. Great, thank you. And I'm, I ha I'm happy to see the modest increase this year and not a high increase in rates being proposed. We'll have a chance to see this at council in June. So is there a motion to accept the report? Motion to accept. Second. All right, let's vote. Candelas? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Foley? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Thank you. Great, and now we're on to, as everyone knows, my very favorite topic, uh, Climate Smart. Uh, Carrie, go ahead and kick us off when you're ready. Uh, good afternoon, Carrie Romano, Director of Environmental Services, and we are excited to share our semi-annual update on Climate Smart Activities. So recall in the semi-annual update, um, we talk about kind of what we've done in the last little bit, and then we share what we're working on um, in the near and sometimes uh, longer term. And um, I think we're making a lot of progress. Uh, we're not at carbon neutrality yet, 
but, uh, but we are definitely um, gaining a lot more uh, accelerated movement and then participation from the community as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Julie Benibente. Julie is our Deputy Director uh, leading Climate Smart across uh, many departments in the city. Good afternoon. Um, and also just want to celebrate Earth Month since we're in April now. So just a really quick um, background. We're going to uh, go through a little bit of background on Climate Smart. Um, we're also going to um, provide an update on just some of the core activities, our community engagement and programs and policies, and then give you um, a look on what's on the horizon for Climate Smart. And just as part of our background, um, our plan, the Climate Smart Plan, was approved in 2018. In 2021, we adopted a resolution setting a carbon neutrality by 2030 goal. And in, 20, in June 2022, uh, Council adopted the Pathway to Carbon Neutrality by 2030, a plan which helped to um, prioritize four key strategies around zero emissions vehicles, reduce reducing vehicle miles traveled by 20%, switching out appliances from fossil fuel to electric, and uh, carbon neutral electricity. In terms of some of the core activities under Climate Smart, city staff have acquired uh, 3.5 million in direct funding and in-kind resources in this reporting period. So we're looking at the September through uh, February uh, 2023 reporting period. This is helping to fund community resiliency hub design, urban, an urban freight pilot design, and bikeways and pedestrian improvements. We also applied for 1.7, uh, 1,745,000, sorry, 1,745,000 in external funding in re this reporting period. And we are planning also to submit for um, at least 2 million in applications in the next reporting period. So a lot going on on the funding front. Um, in terms of additional core initiatives, we completed the municipal greenhouse gas inventory during this reporting period. And we also initiated the Climate Smart Plan update, um, which we had, when we adopted the plan, agreed that we would do um, updates approximately every four years. And we also um, had outreach to inform the Climate Advisory Commission, which will be coming to council in May. For community outreach and engagement, we concluded our Go Green Teams pilot uh, with 22 teams, which included 168 actions completed by those teams with more in progress, uh, resulting in 122 tons of CO2 reduced and over 30,000 in utility bill savings. So these are these neighborhood-based uh, grassroots teams that um, are working towards climate smart goals as well. Our city departments also had several equity-based co-creation tactics employed through the Zero Emissions Neighborhood, or ZEN pilot, as well as through DOT's shared e-mobility services. And with that, I'll pass it over to Ramses. Thanks, Julie. Uh, Ramses Madhu, Division Manager of Planning Policy and Sustainability in DOT. Um, last year was a really big year for transportation planning and new programs. Um, we've talked a lot about them, but we're gonna, cap, we're gonna highlight one that happened right at the end of the year in our uh, last reporting period, which is uh, Council's adoption um, of the Transportation Demand Management and Parking uh, Ordinance Update. Um, as you know, this removed all parking minimums across the, uh, the city. Um, and if you have noted in the news lately, um, uh, this is being discussed even more every day. Uh, there, there's an immense amount of articles coming out um, and many layers of, of the press and across the country. Uh, we're seeing this uh, move uh, being taken uh, now um, uh, across the country. So it's pretty, we were leading, or one of the leading cities in that. Um, importantly, we did add, of course, the transportation demand management side to the other side of the coin here, right? Build less parking, make sure you're still investing in the transportation system for those who are not using uh, uh, the automobile and kind of help uh, make that economy work out better. Um, and that, of course, is, is shifting um, uh, trips over. Um, that rule doesn't go into effect until April 10th, actually. We're still working on some technical elements there, and that was the, the effective date um, on that. And with that, I will pass it over to Kate. Thank you. Good afternoon. Kate Ziemba, Senior Environmental Program Manager with the Community Energy Department. Um, the first program we'll talk about under zero emission vehicles is the California Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, also known as Cali VIP. 
This is a partnership with the California Energy Commission to provide 14 million in rebates to install level two and fast chargers at multifamily housing, workplaces and public places. It launched in late 2020 and chargers will continue to be installed through 2025. About 35% of the funding will go towards chargers located in, in communities that the state defines as low income or disadvantaged. And so far, 100 level two and 11 uh, direct current fast chargers have been installed. In November, the city council approved San Jose Clean Energy's fast charging hubs pilot pro project, which aims to install more charging infrastructure in uh, areas lacking infrastructure and increasing EV adoption. And so the city through this pilot will enter into pay for performance tolling agreements with one or more developers who will own, operate and maintain the hubs. And we believe this contracting structure will result in higher reliability. And importantly, San Jose Clean Energy will set retail pricing with the goal of making charging affordable for residents of the surrounding neighborhoods and incentivizing middle of the day charging. And then finally, on May 2nd, Council will consider the new building reach code update prepared by multiple departments that would allow new multifamily EV charging infrastructure requirements to maximize access to charging. In 2023, San Jose Clean Energy customers are receiving our green source service as a default, which is 60% renewable and 95% carbon free. Green source rates are also one to 3% lower than PG&E. Customers continue to upgrade to total green for 100% renewable energy. We now have more than 1700. And to meet this demand for renewable energy, we continue to contract for new renewable and reliability resources, including solar, wind, short and long duration battery storage and geothermal. Some resource have resources have already begun operating while some will come online in the next several years and together these resources will provide enough renewable energy to power about 300,000 homes. Council approved our integrated resources plan in October which included a portfolio uh, modeling that achieves our carbon neutral by 2030 goal. San Jose Clean Energy also launched energy efficiency programs in September 2022, and these will run through the end of 2024. We are offering a residential program called the Home Appliance, Home Appliance Savings Program, which offers 50 to 70% discounts on efficient electric appliances like refrigerators, washers, and dryers, as well as free smart thermostats. And uh, two groups are eligible for this program single family households lo located in certain census tracts in the city that have higher levels of pollution, as well as moderate income single family households located single, uh, citywide. As of February, customers have ordered 140 smart plugs, 119 smart thermostats, 10 appliances. We are also offering a, a program for businesses and schools called our Energy Efficient Business Program. This offers 80%, 80 to 90% discounts on HVAC, water heating, and refrigeration components. And this program has seen a lot of growth in the recent months with 65 businesses served and 125 more businesses and a school district in progress. And I'll now pass it back to Julie. Thanks, Kate. So in late uh, 2022, staff executed a four-year agreement with block power this was for our building electrification and workforce development accelerator program um, we're expecting to launch through that program a turnkey electrification services for residential customers in the next reporting period we're targeting 250 upgrades uh, for buildings and 50 contractors um, to receive electrification workforce training And on the electrification workforce development front, we've been working with labor organizations and local, regional, and statewide organizations to leverage available resources and bring training to contractors in San Jose. We've also been developing a contractor list and a survey in order to determine what is the best method to reach contractors and communicate with contractors in San Jose for future programming. 
For our building performance ordinance, which was adopted in 2018, and it applies to non-residential and multifamily buildings that are 20,000 uh, 20, square feet or larger, that program is actually in a beyond benchmarking phase starting in 2023. So that's gonna require that buildings meet key performance standards or take energy and water efficiency improvement steps in order to remain in compliance. Staff has, have been gearing up uh, for implementation of this phase and developed a web page and resources with training webinars to assist covered properties with compliance. And then just looking ahead, I won't go through this full list, but you can see um, we've got a lot in the works and um, several milestones we anticipate reaching in the next reporting period, as well as several large items that we're bringing to City Council for consideration in the next reporting period and beyond. So with that, we'll go to questions. Great, That's thank you for the very thorough report. Uh, and now let's go to public comment. Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Peekman here. Uh, can you, I hope you can hear my mic okay. If yes, you we can hear you. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, for this item, I just wanted to comment. Uh, Climate change is an important issue, and we've been dealing with uh, some really weird storms uh, this past year. I don't know if it is a indication of what our storms are gonna be like in the future, but I, I think it really was a telling tale about that uh, we may have some serious sea level rise issues going around uh, the Bay Area, all around the low-lying areas of the Bay. And I, 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 I've sat here, often that I just hope we can learn how to speak on this subject more clearly in our future of community efforts and, and practices. And uh, I know real estate is important for yourselves, but we just really have to be honest about how we talk about climate change and what is going around the Bay Area at this time and what our low-lying uh, areas around the Bay are suffering from. And we have to just really be honest and clear about that. You, you, you started a whole new set of uh, funding dollars for sewer and stormwater related issues, federal dollars, that it's my hope that, uh, you know, your good practices that you'll be having in this area can, can uh, you can talk to people of Oakland about this and city government so who I think they need some help uh, in how to talk to federal agencies to, to receive these sort of federal dollars. And that as you're going to be dealing with um, the, these are issues that are going to help uh, address how to how to address homeless issues around creeks and, and things that I hope you have a real soft, sensitive touch and use really good communication skills. And, and this is a time to really develop uh, a good rapport and a good relationship. Back to the committee. All right, thank you. Let's start with Councilmember Ortiz. Thank you uh, so much. First off, I just want to thank our staff for their excellent work. Um, I think uh, when it comes to climate change, uh, that's one of the major issues that are at the forefront of all of us because it deals with the city, uh, the, the future of, of you know the world, and of course our city. And uh, when, when I what I believe is our most you know precious assets, which is our our children, when our our next generation. So. Um, this is exactly the type of work we should be working on and investing in and, and making sure that as, as the city grows that we do so in a way that um, you know, preserves our environment and you know, does as, much, as little as harm as possible uh, to the environment. Uh, another you know, concern, I did see that uh, you, you did mention uh, uh, issues of workforce and that you are working uh, with some of the labor groups um, and organizations. Uh, have we looked at you know, and I agree we need to be doing this, but us, have we also looked at the potential job loss that may be impacted as we move into climate smart? Uh, well, we're already doing it, but as we continue to move forward on this plan, and if there is any way, I don't know, to offset some of the job loss, whether it's like through purple pipe projects or, or et cetera. I just wanted to hear um, if staff have this at the front of their mind and where they are in the thoughts. Thank you for the question. You know, we do have a desire, as you know, to significantly expand Purple Pipe and are looking for, for funding. The real um, logjam on that one is how to pay for it. And so, um, so what we're trying to do is, is, as you suggest, 
look at the, the many things we could do and then say, do, you know, which ones do we think we can afford? If not, how do we go get money for them? Because we still need more purple pipe, right? And then how do we work with which, why we engage a third party? How do we bring in block power and others to ensure we're doing broad enough um, workforce development so that no one's left behind? And so we really are tracking that. And we don't have um, a forecast today um, with the you know, steps that the Bay Area Air Quality Management District has taken. We're really hoping they have some, some job data as well. But in conversations predominantly through block power and then with the labor groups, we're trying to get a handle on that so that we're working together with them to, step, to stage projects, right? Like if maybe it makes more sense to do more purple pipe in two years rather than today because that's when there'll be a pickup in electrification and a slowdown in some piping. So we're looking to, to sort of stage those uh, to, to the way that it makes sense for the labor force, but it also makes sense for us economically, right? Mm -hmm. Because if there's more work than workers right now, it's gonna be more expensive. So we wanna balance mm -hmm. all that together. Now that, that makes a total sense and I appreciate you um, acknowledging staff's concern and attention on that sensitive you know, topic because there's multiple you know, groups you know, obviously electricians would benefit from the electrification and pipe fitters wouldn't, right? And so mm -hmm. it's like um, balancing, you know, because it's so as someone who's been in the pipe trades for 20 or 30 years, oh yeah, there's going to be new jobs go through the IBW uh, uh, apprenticeship program, right? That may not be as well received uh, than somebody coming out of college or high school who are like, hey, I want to enter, enter this career. So, you know, Purple pipes are something that I definitely think are, are one avenue, but you mentioned funding, so happy to, you know, consider me as a partner. I'd love to f identify ways uh, um, because I want to preserve as many jobs that pay a livable wage here that don't require a degree. Um, and, you know, trades have been an avenue for, for working poor to join the, work, the middle class. So appreciate well, that. Well, thank you. And we will definitely take, your offer, take you up on your offer to, uh, to partner. You know, my, my analogy is I can only imagine if, if Kip showed up one day and said, Carrie, you're going to train to be a librarian. I'd be like, what? Um, okay. Like, that would be shocking for me and probably for Jill, too. Uh, but, um, but, you know, just balancing how that feels. We do a lot of that at the regional wastewater facility as well as we have all this new equipment coming on. You know, we, we try to say, hey, who's, who's interested in learning that and who wants to stay with, you know, the stuff that uh, they built their career on? And uh, we need both. So definitely we'll engage you on that. And please let us know if there's uh, things you think we, you know, forums we should be going to, other folks we should be talking to that we don't have on our radar. Julie, anything to add? Yeah, and I just wanted to mention too, because we have been talking with the pipe fitters um, and we connected them with the regional uh, workforce developments happening. It's, it's a group that's, I think it's mainly based out of the East Bay, but they're also working with San, uh, San Francisco. And we just recently joined as well to talk about how do we make this transition, right? And then um, they've also been working with us and we're looking to have them on our community advisory board for the block power so that we can make sure that we, you know, consider their um, what they're interested in as well and I think um, from what my initial conversations with them it did seem like um, they they see that this is where things are going and so they they actually are just looking at um, the service portion of it so with still with some of the equipment that's out there how do they train up their staff to make sure that you know they can still be part of that workforce because it's still going to be needed mm -hmm. even from the pipe fitters, they're not, they're not going yeah. away. <laughs> yeah. Julie, have we shared the advisory board for Block Power? Maybe give them a little bit of context for who's on that. Yeah, so we, we don't have it fully established right now, so we're just looking, we're trying to recruit to bring people on um, as part of this community advisory board for Block Power. So that, that board, the intent is for them to help develop the program, so both the accelerator program, but also the workforce development portion of that. So kind of two aspects of it. Um, and they, and they actually probably will be two separate um, groups of like a workforce development um, group and then the community advisory. Um, but they, so we're looking at community-based organizations and trying to see, you know, who would be interested to help to build up that program. We would just want to make sure also that the outreach part of it is, um, you know, makes sense and is reaching the right people because it does have a component that's focused on disadvantaged communities in San Jose and helping to do upgrades in those um, homes as well. So 
Um, that's all we have right now, but we'll have more in a couple of weeks probably because uh, we're trying to recruit right now for that board. Yeah, our intentional strategy with Block Powers because it is such an important um, endeavor for us is not to have it just be city staff thoughts because I'm not a pipe fitter. I don't know what's out there. And so making sure we're getting the folks that are most impacted and most knowledgeable, helping to shape and, and co-create the, um, the program so that it hits the right spots. Well, I, I appreciate your comments. Definitely seems like you are approaching it with the, the right perspective. Um, and you know, as, as, as we make our decisions, as we go forth in City Hall, there's always gonna be benefiters and some communities who may be impacted. So I think as long as we're making room for those impacted communities to be a part of the conversation, um, I, I'm supportive of what we're doing. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Candelas. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks, staff, for the presentation. I, I think um, ensuring we're moving the needle on our GHG reduction targets is, is imperative of what we do, especially for, like my colleague said, for our future generations. I, I, I have a question on, I, 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 I think we're doing a great job on the electrification and, and, and doing what we can with, with, our, with our grid, but with regards to water use efficiency and looking at reach codes pertaining to the, the, the reducing the use or what we can, decentivize the use of water in our future development targets. Um, you know, I, I know uh, reach codes are, are, or building codes are annu updated on a triannual basis, but I guess, uh, you know, are we, are we looking at um, exploring potential water use efficiencies with regards to our reach code because I mean we're, we're pushing the, the envelope with our with our uh, GHG targets and our electrification but are we doing the same with 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 water and something you know a little bit you know at the forefront of everybody's mind well not not so much lately but <laughs> but uh, but well, you never know boom bus cycles are, are, are a regular thing now Yes, thank you, and that um, we are working on kind of the whole water supply picture and understanding, you know, what options we have today, but also what future needs will be, and how we, with a particular focus on reducing the demand on potable water, since um, that sort of has very unique uses. And then there are things like 50% of our uses outdoors. How do we not use potable water for that? Uh, where it makes sense, um, and so we're shaping up that plan. I think with a lot more insight. We'll be able to then say, you know, should we do what some cities have done and say, if you're within this proximity to a purple pipe, you have to connect um, or you have to dual plumb. Um, we're not really ready to make that call yet because there are some some economic factors and it does having recycled water in your building does increase um, the staff you have to have and how you maintain it. And so we want to make sure it gets to the desired results. So um, in summary, my answer is not yet. But, uh, but definitely working, uh, working collaboratively with Valley Water and with others to make sure that what we put out makes sense. Um, Kip, you're big in the water world. Anything to add to that? Wisdom is always love, Kip. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager, I, I think Carrie's right on point. And I think regardless of where we are in the in the, the, the flood or drought cycle, I think we're, we're working to make conservation as a way of life. And, a, and to point back to Climate Smart, kind of the good life 2.0, is to do that in a way that for the most part people don't notice the impacts. And I think we can do a lot with that. The good news is one of the best things we can do around water usage in terms of development is to continue to encourage dense infill. The, the amount of water that folks in that kind of unit use versus single family is just so dramatically less that that alone is a huge shift. And so in addition to that, we'll also be looking over the coming months at some of the larger water uses users and what we might be able to do to encourage them to use, as Carrie said, more recycling for things like cooling and other uses like that. But I think it's a very important topic and we, we do hope to be coming back to this committee with some pretty uh, interesting proposals over the next uh, months and years. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions and uh, I look forward to a lot of, lot more water conversations. If, if this is out of our purview, but I've come to believe that the biggest impact we can have on water use is to uh, transition our friends in the agriculture sector to drip irrigation. Um, I think the amount of water that we waste on the current methods of watering are far dwarf anything that we can do locally to conserve water in Santa Clara County, although there are some agriculture users in Santa Clara County. But um, anyway, just something on the top of my mind. But 
outside the scope of this conversation today. Um, thank you for the, the update on Climate Smart. Um, as I said, I, I really enjoy this topic and I look forward to a lot of these coming actions that the Council is going to be discussing in the next few months, particularly the creation of the Climate Commission. I think that'll be great to get people involved in brainstorming how we move forward. I have a few, just a few questions. Um, the first one on the REACH codes, I know we were supposed to have a conversation, it got delayed. When we, when we discussed that item at this committee, I think it was at the end of last year, one of the, it was, it was, the conclusion that had been made was that the cost difference between having EV, uh, I forget the terminology, EV ready versus EV um, capable, right, right. <laughs> um, was minimal. Was, there was almost no, not much difference, and therefore it was a logical thing. Is that, is that still what's in the a conclusion, or has there been a change, and that's why we're having more conversation that, on this? That's not why we're having more conversations, but Ram says, do you want to answer the, um, <laughs> the cost or Kate, the cost effectiveness? I don't have the facts off the top of my head. Um, I don't know if, Kate, you do. Yeah. Um, so the one piece that we're looking at um, based on just input that we received from the community was this concept of direct wiring and that um, does increase the cost um, slightly over the current reach code and so that's what's in that was what was in the memo that was posted and that we're going back to talk with developers about actually next week um, and um, anticipate a supplemental memo before the May 2nd. Okay, thanks. And I'm happy to have more conversations offline. I just wanted to. Yeah, so the delay short. is, you know, developers had some questions. It made sense to pause and make sure we heard from everybody mm -hmm. and, um, and um, everybody heard from us and then uh, revise as needed and bring it back. Yep, I appreciate that. Um, as far as, uh, well, I guess, kind of along these lines about funding a lot of this stuff, in the fall, we're going to be reaching that point at which uh, our energy, our San Jose Clean Energy will have its reserves and therefore we'll begin to start being able to invest in some of these projects from some other types of funding sources. I guess my just more gen basic question, next time we see this update will be about the same time, about six months from now. Um, will we be able to see some, some recommendations as to how we might be investing San Jose Clean Energy reserves in helping us move the needle on this work? Thank you for your question. Um, in the fall, um, we will not have reached our reserve target yet, but we will be working on the next iteration of our program's roadmap, which will be due to T&E in early 2024. So um, we could preview some things we're thinking about, but it will be fully baked in early 2024 for your consideration. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd understood that uh, that we were going to reach that reserve spot sometime around November, so that means we, but maybe that's changed a little bit since uh, since the last conversation. Did Kip, I see you. No, no, it is right on. I think it's November, December. I mean, it all depends on what the energy markets are. And so the, the idea is we'll be working uh, those program recommendations in anticipation right. of that. At this point, as Kate said, we would come back to T&E e to get your direction on how we approach that program uh, in the, like January, February, March timeframe. We can shift that if, if that uh, direction uh, needs to change, but that's our current plan. Okay, I just wanna be ahead of it and be ready to go because obviously I think we're all, we all have a lot of ideas of how we might be able to invest. Yeah, in yes, resources. and we would fold the actual um, budget change into the budget process is the anticipation at this point because that's we don't uh, pull out uh, those funding uh, kind of considerations separate from the actual budget process so we'd bro we would fold in your your direction on the uh, from the uh, program guide into the next annual budget process okay thank you uh, and then the last question on page nine you had a, a, a building electrification comment about I think we said I forget number 40 buildings or something that is that are whatever the number was on the slide um, what, what does that mean? Are those, are those retrofits of existing buildings? Is that what that was? Um, I believe the 40 uh, referred to businesses who are, um, that were in progress for being served by our energy efficient business program, so energy efficiency measures. Um, but since, but the 40 businesses was as of February, but as of last month, the program really picked up and there are actually 125 businesses in process of being served mostly with uh, refrigeration uh, compo um, upgrades. Okay, that's good, that's great. So there, maybe I misinterpreted, there wasn't, there wasn't 
there, there's not a lot of building retrofit work being done yet at this point. No, just on the ener energy efficiency okay. side, more HVAC components, refrigeration, right, water right. heating. Okay, thank you. All right, did we have a motion? Move to accept the report. Second. We need to cross-reference it to City Council. It, it will be, uh, our, our, yes, I guess we do. <laughs> okay, I'll include that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Candelas? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Foley? Aye. And Cohen? Aye. Thank you. All right, that wraps up our agenda, brings us to open forum. Blair? All right, Blair Beekman, thanks for the meeting today. I need to quickly go to my uh, speech here. With the recent uh, arrest, of an SJPOA executive manager for pharmaceutical and fentanyl importing and distribution. All of us in San Jose, in the San Jose community need to learn how to develop a clear, honest account and reporting and how and where the San Jose PD, SJPOA, SJ city government, and even everyday community may have had a role with the recurring cycles of fentanyl use, over, overdoses and deaths that have been happening in San Jose and in the South Bay and to learn to more openly describe how these practices may be taking place in PDs, POAs, local governments, and communities across the state and across the country. There are many good guidelines and practices uh, for that everyday people of individual local communities can, uh, can begin to better understand, develop, and decide around the concepts of human rights, civil rights, worker rights, civil protections, open participatory democracy, and public oversight in the local area, in their local area. Oakland's love life philosophy and, and tech accountability ideas are two examples of this. Uh, it is a current hope that these types of uh, good practices uh, can be developed by everyday people and, and to work to work at the national level eventually collectively to help uh, create concepts of uh, peace and not war or harm and decision making. This letter is to help remind we simply have guidelines and policies developing about human rights, uh, uh, open democracy, accountability, and, and public oversight that we need to learn uh, to not harm everyday community uh, in the future of policy making. And from this, we should also be uh, clear, making clear the years of uh, effort in San Jose and the more recent San Jose uh, RIPS efforts to create better community police oversight for the future of San Jose and is meant to help address and prevent issues. Back to the committee. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you.